Hello and welcome to the weekly podcast of the Community Praise Center Alexandria, Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad you decided to join us today by downloading and listening to this week's featured message. We pray that you allow God to teach and inspire you while you listen. Delivering this week's message is Community Praise Center's Senior Pastor, Henry Wright. Father, we're grateful. You have blessed us with a new year. It is a gift. And as Audrey so ably pointed out, it's a blank sheet of paper. We've already started writing. We pray that our hands and our deeds will be guided by the Holy Spirit. So every page written will be one of joy and victory and steadfastness, for there will be rough times. But we can be steadfast even in the rough times. So thank you for the gift of today, the gift of this year, for the blessings of the past and for the hope for the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Our theme for the year, you see it up there on the sign, let's say it together. From Passover to Jubilee, Christ's miracle in me. Again. From Passover to Jubilee, Christ's miracle in me. And my purpose today in both sermons is to kind of set the tone for the year in terms of where we want to go. Next Sabbath morning, I'll be preaching again to First Church. And my subject, because it's Stewardship Weekend, will be the cost to the Lamb. The cost to the Lamb. And next week, we'll talk about the sacrifice that Jesus made. It was way more than dying on a cross. Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. Thank you, Elder Canoe, for leading us in the reading of that passage. Let's go there now and look at it. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Excellent sound, Brother Moon. Excellent sound, sir. (laughs) And as we did before, Denise, let's all join in again and read the passage because it's so vital to be giving you the groundwork for this year. And this morning will be more of a teaching sermon than a preaching sermon. I may get carried away a few moments, but I want to teach this morning. You have to have this foundation, otherwise the sermons for the rest of the year will not make sense to you. Reading verse 18 together, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Who's talking here? Jesus. Jesus is talking. Continue. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Very interesting phrase, the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, the setting is that Jesus is preaching his first sermon at home since launching his ministry. His reputation has preceded him. The home folk who saw him as a boy, saw him playing in the dirt, saw him helping his daddy with the wood. The home folk have been hearing about him. His reputation has preceded him, his his healings, his, his many miracles, his preaching. Even the opposition of the church leadership to him has been discussed at home. What is the homeboy up to? And so when he returned home, everybody wanted to hear him preach. I relate to the story, Greta, because I remember the first time I came home from Oakwood College and the bad little Henry Wright, where it had gotten out, he was now studying for the ministry. People were, they were aghast, were shocked. Surely the Lord has lost his mind. The boy who stayed in trouble in church, (laughs) who often spent Sabbath school, my mother taught Sabbath school, standing in the corner, because I wouldn't act right in Sabbath school, Sister Reese. Lord help me. He's coming home to preach. The church was packed. (laughs) so i can relate to this story jesus is there and as his custom was 
He was in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Somebody say amen. amen. God's holy Sabbath, the seventh day. There he was. And out of respect and perhaps also prompted by curiosity, as I recall when they asked me to preach, as the pastor said, he said, there's no way you can come home and not preach. Everybody wants to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I didn't have much to say in those years. <laughs> but out of respect to the young man, the young Jesus, the young carpenter, the former carpenter, the pastor gave way, Keith, and handed him the scrolls. And in those days, according to the custom, you didn't pick your own scripture. The presiding elder picked a scripture, gave it to you, and you had to have something to say. Lord, have mercy. And then, of course, according to the custom, he did not stand, Sophie, but he sat. When it was time to preach, you sat down and expounded on the word. It's quite a moment. Because the reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. In fact, the exact same words that are found in Luke are found in Isaiah. It was a direct reading. And so, Rick, in this moment, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together in Christ. Here's Christ the Savior, whose life is recorded in the New Testament, reading from the Old Testament, Old and New joined together on this Sabbath day as the Savior preaches his ministry. Preaches whose ministry? His ministry. Brother Bogans, Christ is about to define his ministry. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. But what's even more thrilling to me is that the Jesus, who through the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible, now preaches the Bible. Boy, I wish I could have been in church that day. The Spirit hovering over him, the people sitting in anticipation. Now the author and finisher of our faith, the creator of all mankind, he who wrote Isaiah through the Holy Spirit now preaches. How can you sit there? It's just so exciting to me to think about. All heaven listens now as the author of Scripture preaches the Scripture. I'm interested in his phrase, the acceptable year of the Lord. The Bible and commentary, the Bible commentary says, the acceptable, listen, we're teaching, the acceptable year of the Lord is reminiscent of the year of Jubilee. The year of what? When slaves were freed, debts canceled. <laughs> Do you think that if the United States of America, come on, y'all, announced that 2011 was the year of Jubilee and all deaths were canceled. Do you think this would be a good year? <laughs> Slaves freed, debts canceled. Any land that was mortgaged was turned back to the original owner. Now, Jesus ties his ministry to this because, notice what he says, I've come to preach deliverance to the who? Uh, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. So he's tying his ministry to this because the acceptable year, Gabriel, was actually this jubilee year which happened every 50 years. Every when? It only happened every 50 years. Every 50 years. Jesus is tying his ministry to this and specifically ties his ministry to the year of Jubilee. But what you need to know today for the purpose of this year's preaching is that the year of Jubilee was the last feast of seven. How many? So Jesus is not just tying his ministry to the year of Jubilee. He's tying his ministry to the feast system, which was from Passover to Jubilee. The Feast of Jubilee was the last feast of seven. So the acceptable year, hear me, the acceptable year wasn't just the Feast of Jubilee. The acceptable year, listen, I'm defining now, the acceptable year was a system of feasts, Deborah, from Passover through the blowing of trumpets, six feasts took place every year 
And then every 50th year, the seventh feast took place. Did you follow that? And the feast system was more, Ron, than just a series of liturgical moments. But the feast system, Allison, actually was an allegory of the entire experience of salvation. So every year, how many years? Every year, through the feast system, they were reminded of everything they had to experience to be saved. See, in the Christian church, we only have one feast. We're having it today. It's called communion. We have one feast. That's it. But they had no died Savior. So all their feasts pointed to the Savior. Are you listening to me, church? And Jesus, Eric, is tying his ministry to this system. I think I've got you with me now. And so we chose this theme from Passover to Jubilee, Christ miracle in me because during this year we want to review we want to review very carefully what God is doing in you on a daily basis to save you from yourself I was talking to a friend the other day who had been traveling and they were sharing with me some of their experiences I remember saying to them, I said, I'm sure your guardian angel is glad you're back home. Folks, some of us in 2010 have worked our guardian angel over time. Go on and say amen. That brother was breathing hard December 31st. Praying for strength to take you into 2011. I, I think, in fact, when, when, when Jesus comes and saves us, the most relieved people in heaven will be guardian angels. They will say, thank God it's over. We've worked these holy beings over time with stubborn decisions. Come on and say amen. Hard heads that will not listen, will not give way. We're just going to go on anyhow and do what we want to do anyhow. And the poor angel is just scuffling and running and doing and preventing accidents and sparing our lives. Let's give the guardian angels a hand of applause right now. In fact, when you come up out of your grave, if you're dead when Christ comes, the first thing you ought to do is hug that rascal. Say, thank you. He's going to say, forget that. Let's just get on out of here and get to heaven. The acceptable year, therefore, is a cycle of truth presented to these people every year. Stay with me. And this system was commanded and then inaugurated by God himself way back in the days of Israel. Go with me to Exodus, the 12th chapter. That's the chapter I'm preaching on for the second service, by the way. For the second service, I will deal specifically with Passover. But let's look at the beginning. And you'll note the wording. The wording is so appropriate for today. You know, we rarely, Hank Branch, have a Sabbath day and a New Year's day the same day. Note the wording. The, wor the, wor the wording is almost, it, it, it is, it's designed for today's worship. Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2. You see it? Come on, we're still learning. Let's read. And the Lord, I need everybody, Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, where are they? They're in Egypt. They're in Egypt, Mark. They're slaves. Remember Jesus said, I've come to preach setting at liberty. They're slaves. See, this, this is classic. While in Egypt still slaves, the Lord speaks to Moses and Aaron and says, verse 2. Come on and read it. Verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of month. The Lord establishes a new year that day. This month shall be to you the beginning of month. Read on. It shall be the first month of the year to you. What am I going to do to establish this new year? Verse 3. 
reading. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, Make a one call. See, make a one call. Read on. In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Because my subject this afternoon is start the year with a lamb. So it starts. And that first feast was called Passover. Passover. We'll talk about that this afternoon. I have to resist getting into it now. Passover. And from Passover, for the rest of the year, they had various feasts to take them along the way. Hmm. Let's go to this jubilee situation that Jesus ties into. Go to Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25. And you can see how Jesus links his ministry to this jubilee and the whole system. But Leviticus 25 describes jubilee. It's an, it, was, it, was an awesome, it was an awesome occasion. Leviticus 25. Now, understand that when you're reading the Bible, some of you will read the Bible through this year, that Leviticus 25, scratch, that Leviticus was the church manual of the ancient church. Every worship service is outlined here in detail. And they were told how to have church. Everything they did in the temple was outlined in Leviticus. It was their church manual. And to show you how serious God was, a couple of young preachers didn't take some of the instructions seriously. Nadab and Abihu and fire came out of the temple and consumed them. This is a serious book. In fact, it's in this book that God keeps saying, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And the 25th chapter, the 23rd outlines all the feasts. But in the 25th chapter, the closing feast that took place once every 50 years is outlined. Look at verses 1 through 7 of Exodus, of, of Leviticus 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the Mount of Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come unto the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. Verse 4. But in the what year? shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. And for seven straight periods, six rest, six rest, six rest, seven times they were to do that. And then in the 50th year after the seventh time, Jubilee. Jubilee. Now, look what happened in Jubilee. Verse 10. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim, what's the next word? Liberty. Liberty. Throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof, it shall be a what? Unto you. Ye shall return every man unto his possession. Ye shall return every man unto his family. Verse 14. Read. And if thou, verse 14, and if thou shalt aught unto thy neighbor or buyest aught of thy neighbor's land, ye shall not oppress one another. And on down through this chapter, it outlines all the blessings that would come in the 50th year. Six years rest. They couldn't plant. Six years rest. They couldn't plant. Six years rest. Seven times they did that, and then Jubilee. Jubilee. Now, God is teaching them several things. First of all, that the land belongs to God. That everything needs rest, even the earth. But more than anything else, on the 50th year, he was reminding them, there's nothing you have that's really yours. And every 50th year, they have this experience. See, some people sitting in this room right now are living in Passover. Passover. You're being delivered. The Passover feast was followed by a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
That was the feast that celebrated sanctification. For seven days they ate nothing but unleavened bread. That is, it was a purification process. You see, here's the thing about deliverance. Now listen, listen to your pastor. He delivered them from Egypt into the wilderness. They didn't get it. I'll say it again. You're delivered into the wilderness. <laughs> it's going to come. I'll say it one more time. You're delivered from Egypt and then taken to the... You have Passover, then you have unleavened bread. See, when God, Meshach, initially calls you from sin, you're not ready for the promised land. You're only ready for the wilderness. It's coming. They, 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 they tried to get with me. It's coming. I, I, you, you cannot miss this. Because if you get it, you'll stop complaining about the wilderness. That's all you're fit for after deliverance. It's in the wilderness that he works on you and remakes you and reshapes you and retunes you. Nobody who's saved from sin is fit for the promised land. You've got to go through the wilderness first. You've got to drink the bitter waters of Mara. You've got to chew on the manna. You've got to get over your lust for meat. <laughs> in the wilderness! And then, and then, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was followed by a feast called Pentecost. Are you listening to me? See, once you're passed over, your past is done away with, he gets you out of Egypt, takes you to the wilderness where he can work on you. Then you need power. I guess I'm preaching to these seats. You need power. You need Pentecost. You can't get through the wilderness without Pentecost. Because the real work of transforming you is done by the Holy Ghost. You can't do it. You see what's happening, Sandra? Through the feast, he's teaching them how he saves them. a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous lesson book. But here's what scares me. Here's what scares your pastor. Gerard, they did it so many years, it lost its meaning. See, how many communions do you sit through and never change? You've heard me say it, Coretta. You've heard your pastor say it. I'm going to say it again today. The most dangerous thing about religion is religion. The most dangerous thing about church is church. Because, Ken, it reaches the point where it becomes ritualistic, liturgical, a process. And we forget that the process is not just worship. The process is transformation. To sit in church Sabbath after Sabbath and, and, and weekend after weekend and month after month and not experience transformation is an insult to the Lord. God's not in the entertainment business. He's in the salvation business. He passed over you. He took your past and did away with it. Hallelujah! But it's not just to feel good. So Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost. And then the next feast, all these feasts are listed in Leviticus 23, was the blowing of trumpets. What's the purpose of trumpets in the old days? An announcement. <laughs> Go ahead, Gerard. He's a military man. He got it right away. Military man. An announcement. The blowing of trumpets feast, the next feast, is an announcement. Is anybody listening to me? So what could that represent? No, you're almost there. There's another feast coming there. What's the work of the church? To announce! See, once you're passed over, 
and you're in the unleavened bread period where God is transforming you, and you get the power, what's the reason why the Lord receives, what's the reason why the church receives Pentecost in the last days? So that we may announce, we may blow the trumpet in Zion. So the work of the church is in the feast system. This is not a club. We come and sit and say amen and go home. Every sermon you hear should give you reason to make an announcement. Tell somebody what you got this past Sabbath. Tell somebody. Preacher may have a bad day. Make up something, but tell somebody something. Just go to church and go home. Go to church and go home. No, no. We have to blow the trumpet. That's our work. And God has blessed us in 2010 to blow the trumpet so loud somebody in Kenya heard the trumpet. That's our work. We don't stream just to try to be important. We stream. At, we spend that thousands of dollars we put into this building so we can blow the trumpet. Last night I spent a half hour on the phone with Sister Beneath the middle down there in South Carolina, and last night she accepted the Sabbath fully. Amen. Pastor, I see it. We study the change of the Sabbath. I see, all my questions are answered. Blow the trumpet. Amen. You've got relatives and friends, co-workers. You went throughout all 2010. You never blew the trumpet at all. Didn't tell them nothing. How can you come here with a clear conscience? A part of the feast system was blowing the trumpets after Passover, after unleavened bread, after Pentecost. Now blow the trumpet. Because the feast of blowing the trumpets is followed by the feast called the Day of Atonement. Are you seeing it now? Are you seeing how these folk got the gospel every year? If they really listened and followed the feast, they would have been a great, powerful people for God. The Day of Atonement, the Day of at one meant. oh, I got a sermon for you on that this year. Woo. In fact, three sermons. Came preaching in one. Three sermons on the Day of Atonement. It was a solemn day in which the Bible said they must afflict their souls. That's the day when the priest went in, trembling, scared to death. Because if there was one unconfessed sin in the camp, God would strike him dead. Because he represented Jesus. And Jesus would have died for one sin. And he backed in. He backed in. Once he got to that curtain, he backed in. Because behind him was the holy presence of God. He had bells on the bottom of his robe, and they kept outside listening. If the bell stopped, he's dead. And then two priests were assigned to back him, grab him by the feet, and pull him out. Thank God in the history of the Day of Atonement, that never happened. Every time a priest, thank you, Jesus, every time a priest went in, he was accepted of God. You ought to say amen. So the next feast was the Day of Atonement. You see, once we have done our work, once we have done our work of blowing the trumpet, then the earth is ready for judgment. The blowing of trumpets leads to judgment. God will not judge the earth fully till the church has done its work. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness unto all nations, Finish it for me, and then shall the end come. It's right here in the fee system. Now, I'm just touching the service. There's way more to the Day of Atonement than that. Woo-wee. But that was the next feast. The Day of Atonement. Some of us, listen to me, because some of us may not see the end of this year. And some of us are living right now in our day of atonement. 
judgment is upon us now. Somebody sitting here, judgment's on you now. Folks, that's a serious thing. God is saying for somebody, I've done all I can do. I've dispensed all the grace and mercy I can. And I know because I know the past and the present and the future, I know there's nothing else I will do that will ever change them. So just like, Lila, somebody's living in the Passover, somebody here today is living in your personal day of atonement where you're having your last opportunity this year to be at one mint. Hallelujah. With God. What do you say, church? Do you want to be one with him? Come on now. Do you want to be one with him? Come on, folks. Do you want to be one with God? My grandma used to say, God's twin. She used to say, Son, I want to be just so much like Jesus, they can't tell me and Jesus apart. At one minute. Well, judgment, listen to me, is going on now. It's called the investigative judgment. We know that, don't we? You say, well, if the day of atonement is judgment, would there be any feast after? Yes. The Feast of Tabernacles. In that feast, they went back and lived in huts and places. See, after judgment is over, the earth is going to go into the time of trouble. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to be taken out of these plush bile carpet homes. We're going to lose our jobs. And those of us who live through the time of trouble will literally be living in huts. Oh, this feast system is powerful. Atonement is followed by tabernacles. And you, all, those of us who live through the time of trouble, the only thing we will have is Jesus. No jobs, no fine houses, maybe a car. We'll just have Christ. We'll be stripped down to nothing but Jesus. The old folks used to sing, I got Jesus. That's enough. Huh? Come on now. Another song says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. God's going to find out if you mean that when you sing that song. If you live through the time of trouble, you will rely fully on your relationship with God. All extraneous extracurricular, superfluous stuff will be stripped from your life. Some of you know what it is. Some of you already know what it is to lose money and lose just about everything you have. You're prepared for the time of trouble. <laughs> now think about it. I've just taken you through their year. Passover. Unleavened bread. Pentecost, blow the trumpet, day of atonement, and then tabernacle. Somebody say amen. amen. Every year, every year, for seven years, seven years, every year, seven years, every year, seven years, seven times, 50th year. And then God said it's over. Because Jubilee is a celebration of the second coming of Jesus, Larry. That's where it comes in. Hallelujah! Jubilee. Folks are going to lose their cool on that day. See, I've always pictured the saved going into the city, holy city, shouting and jumping. When they show me these pictures, folks marching like so, uh-uh. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. When it hits me, I got on a white robe. And golden slippers. And I have no pain in my body. No way in the world I'm going to march in like a shoulder. I'm going to shout like an idiot. Hallelujah. Jubilee. Set free. Set free. A miracle. Christ. Miracle. In me. We're going to spend all year talking about it. Feasting on it. 2 Corinthians 3, 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. My closing text. Second Corinthians 13 and 
in verse 5. Mm, 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 mm. What a text. What a way to end God's word today. What a text. Because it sums up, it sums up what the feast should lead us to do. You see it? Read with me. Examine yourselves. Pause now. Don't read by that. Just pause. You see, the system of feasts, Nicole, were designed to bring them. At each feast, Rick and Marcia, they were to examine themselves. When they celebrated Passover, they were to examine themselves. Have I, in fact, put the past in the past? When they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were to examine themselves. Have I, in fact, accepted the trip through the wilderness? Am I still murmuring and complaining at the discipline of God? When they celebrated Pentecost, they would ask themselves, were they being the witness God wanted them to be? The blowing of trumpets, they would ask themselves, were they in fact, were they in fact sharing God's word? When they got to the Day of Atonement, they would ask themselves, is everything right between me and God? And when they moved into the booths, during that feast, that last feast, they left their homes, left the comfort, and lived in those booths for a week. And they were to ask themselves, Deria, am I ready to give up all to follow the Lord? And then every 50 years, they were shouting all over Israel. See, I, you know, it's a list of things they did, but the one I stick with is all debts. Forgive me while I just celebrate for a minute. All debts were canceled. Hallelujah. All slaves were set free. Examine yourself. Come on. Read on. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. This is a serious text of Scripture, y'all. Examine and prove. Finish it with me. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. I invite you today to accept God's acceptable year, the year of transformation, God's miracle in you. Would you bow your heads as we pray? Lord Jesus, oh, I felt the congregation with me today, Lord. They worship with me today. Their minds fed on the Word. What a powerful Word. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this Bible. There's so much in it. We can never exhaust its great truths. Speak to our hearts today. Somebody's in Passover. Somebody is wandering in the wilderness of unleavened bread. Oh, yes, somebody's being empowered. They're accepting the Holy Spirit. To having Pentecost. Someone, Lord, has decided this year is the year where they will blow the trumpet to family, to friends, to neighbors, to co workers. Somebody, Lord, today is sitting in their day of atonement. May they afflict their souls and confess their wrongs. Somebody's already living in their tabernacle 2010 stripped them they don't have much left but they're steady like a rock they've not been shaken maybe lost their job but they trust Jesus maybe their house was foreclosed on in 2010 but they know the Lord is able and Lord today somebody can experience jubilee jubilee be set free. So, Father, may we accept your plan of salvation fully. Allow you to do your work. Now, your head is bowed, your eyes are closed. 
and you're thankful today for what you have heard and what you have, what you have understood and you're glad you were here as the word spoke to your heart. You're, you're just grateful for God's word and truth. If you're really feeling that, why don't you just raise your hand as you sit there right now. Thank you, Lord, for this word, for this word, for this word. Thank you for the word. Keep your hand up. Your hand is down. Somebody here wants to say yes to Jesus today. You want this to be your Passover or your Jubilee. In many ways, the two feasts are very similar. Both are deliverance. Passover, spiritual deliverance, Jubilee, actual, physical, complete deliverance. You've been thinking about becoming a part of CPC. It's been on your mind. Take your stand, walk down the aisle, receive Bible studies, get ready for baptism. Or you've been thinking about transferring your membership. You want to start this year, the first day of this year. Have they made a decision? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. People are praying, I hope. If you'd like to get up and come, why don't you do that right now? Thank you for joining us for this week's message from Community Praise Center Alexandria, Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you have any questions about the message or would like to contact us with any prayer requests, please visit us at www.cpcsda.org and use the prayer request tool at the top of the page. We invite you to share this message with someone else and look forward to you joining us again next week. We pray that you experience the presence of God always with you.